shall we pray and begin father we say we thank you for today and we thank you for the opening up father of your spirit that we give you all the praise and we give you all the glory we rejoice this is something that that annoys satan it hurts satan the father you have delivered us from his dominion oh praise god praise god there is nothing he can do to get us again he will never get us has never gotten us will ever get us and we rejoice that we are superior to him satan and that hurts him so much that hurts him in the bad place and there's nothing he can do about it that we who are in christ we are superior to satan we are superior to demons we are superior to every oppression of his and there's nothing he can do it he's subservient to us we are in a different camp altogether and what we say is what he the devil will do and that hurts him so we thank you for providing this for us and we should also carry this light to many that not only us would enjoy it but others will enjoy it i pray for revelation knowledge i pray that the eyes will understand will be enlightened i pray that father we shall keep strong in the faith we shall keep fervent in spirit and then also father we shall declare your word if there is anything in our mind that we are still struggling with concerning the concepts of the word of the living God. But I pray that your light will shine on it and bring it up to the fore so that the revelation of Jesus will swallow up that area of struggle that will walk in liberty where which you have set us. I thank you for utterance. I thank you for these amazing saints who have dedicated themselves to the listening and the hearing and the doing of the word. That great things shall come out of their life because of you. For Christ in us is definitely the hope of glory. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Glory, hallelujah. Let me say a very big, 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 you know, good afternoon to Sister Hetty. Good afternoon, Sister Vivian. Good afternoon, Sister Nina and Sister Pauline. Wow, you, you are the frontiers. Hallelujah, that you have, um, you, you, you jumped in early. Praise God. All right, so without much ado, let's continue our subject of study. I'm excited always. As it says, when it comes to the word of God, I can see the whole day and talk about the word of God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. Right. So we said for Full Gospel Church International London branch, you know, our theme for this year is spiritual growth. So we need to understand it from the way the writers of the, of the foundational apostles took it. So no wonder we are studying that under a huge topic, which is evangelism salvation and discipleship in christ these are three key areas that is missing in a lot of churches they don't put emphasis on that but that is where the apostles they put emphasis so we are dealing with spiritual growth and this as it were is season one that means that all the topics that we shall be treating here is actually the foundation of spiritual growth and then next year which will be season two you know we will continue um with it in and from another angle which is very very important so this is part number 38 so in total 38 hours of the teaching on the subject of spiritual growth that tells us how expansive the word of the living god is the word of the living god is not supposed to be rushed the word of the living god is supposed to be taken one step at a time because it is a process and it takes time for anybody to really get the grips of it. Right, so once again, I'll just quickly highlight and do a quick brief recap of what we have studied so far so that it sets the tone for our learning for this week as I sent my, I send my reminders around. So number one, we said that the word spiritual growth creates the impression in people's understanding that it is your spirit inside of you that is growing. So people say that when they say somebody is a baby in Christ, they think that their spirit is baby, like a human baby that is born. That's how they see it. And then as time goes on, their spirit grows, you know, to adult, to like a human being. That is not what spiritual growth is about. We've, we've established that very, very clearly. We said spiritual growth is growing in the understanding of all that Christ has done. That is it. And the only place where that is found are uh, in the epistles. We are not saying that you don't need to read the whole Bible. You are supposed to read the whole Bible, right? But what we are saying basically is that 
spiritual growth is growing in the understanding of all that Jesus has done. So we know that all that Jesus has done cannot be found in Genesis to Malachi. In Genesis to Malachi, it's just rather the prophecy of what Jesus was going to do. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus had not yet died still. <clears throat> Excuse me. It was at the latter part that he died. Okay? At the latter part that he died. Right? So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John does not explain. It does not explain all that Jesus has done. Because at that time, he has not done it. Okay, you get it? Right. So that's why the epistles are the only books that explain what Jesus has done and explain the Old Testament. Okay, so that means that if a person does not read the epistles, then there will be no spiritual growth. That, that I need to keep on harping about it. Okay, if we understand the introduction and I'm giving welcome, Apo Kazadi, and welcome, dear Mrs. Um, Alberta Mensa, bless you. Right. So we need to get that very clear in this, in this aspect of spiritual good. So let me say it again for the benefit of those who just joined. Spiritual good, when we hear the word, is not your spirit inside you growing. You know, that's the impression we all had when we were growing up in the things of God. So we say somebody is a baby Christian. Then we mean that his spirit, you're born against with his baby. See that now? And then he begins to grow. That is not what spiritual growth is. We say spiritual growth is growing in the understanding of what the spirit of Christ made available as or has made available after resurrection. That is spiritual good. And we said that we're not saying that don't read the whole Bible. Read the whole Bible because you need to read them together. But we are seeing that the information where a person, a believer, can find spiritual good cannot be found in Genesis to Malachi. Why? Genesis to Malachi, Jesus had not died. So where would the explanation be about what he has done? He has not even died, let alone do it. So Genesis to Malachi, we call them mystery. They are prophecies and promises of what, how Christ would do it against the sin of Adam. Then in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, he had not also died. He only died in the latter part of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John also do not give any explanation of what Christ has done. Rather, Jesus in his parables, <clears throat> excuse me, was talking about what he was going to do. He says, I'll go to the Father. So he had not yet done it. It was in the latter part. So now we are left with Acts of the Apostles to the book of Revelation. These are the areas that tell us because they came after resurrection. So it is these books that tell us of what we have received in Christ. Very important that we do understand this explanation that I have just given. Very, very important. So now let's do some mathematical equation here. If we understand what I've just said, then it means this. Spiritual growth is found in the epistles. I'm just doing a recap of just last week. That means the, the level or the quantity, allow me to use that word because it, 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 will, it will drive it home. You know, welcome, you know, Pastor um, uh, Fodjo and welcome, Pastor Sherry, to bless you. It will let you understand it well, you understand. So watch this. I'm um, doing a mathematical equation for us to understand, a simple mathematical equation, okay? That means if spiritual growth is, is found only in the epistles, therefore reading Genesis to Malachi will not give you spiritual growth. It just gives you revelation of what Jesus is going to do. Then reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John will not give you spiritual growth because at that time, he still had not died. It was the latter part that he died. The only books that tells us of what Jesus did in the three days and the three nights are the epistles. Okay, are we, are we good with that? All right, that means if you don't read and study the epistles, no spiritual growth. So spiritual growth is not how long a person has been in Christ. A person that can be in Christ for that long, but has never read the epistles. And that is one of the things I said last week that I've come across many Christians. I received Jesus in 1981. And, and from that time onwards till now, I can count the number of believers I've met who are well seated well saturated and know the epistles inside out 
and I'm not joking. I'm not joking, including pastors. I've come across many Christians. And when we chat and when we talk, I can see, I can deduce and I can know where, how far, you know, they are in their epistles. Because when they talk, I can know what concept drives them. If they are legalistic, I know where they have been reading a lot. See that? If they are legalistic, I know where they are reading a lot. If they are, if they are superstitious, I know where the problem is. So the more of the epistles you read, then that is when you are growing spiritually. Number two, the epistles have in them the propensity to cause your interest in the things of God to grow. Because they talk about what Christ has done. So it will be very, very rare for a person to read the epistles, see these facts. I'm, talk, I'm not talking about reading it superficially, but you're giving yourself to it. It is rare to see somebody who's giving themselves to the epistles who are not on fire for Jesus and who are not on fire for evangelism and who are not on fire for the things of Christ. It is rare. The, the epistles, they fuel your passion for Christ. So the two go together. When you study the epistles, your prayer life will be top. Any believer that I see that they don't have an interest in the things of God, I, I can pinpoint with accuracy that if I go and live with them and I observe them, I will notice that they have not been studying the epistles. It's that I've seen it over and over. Years ago, and I'll not mention it, I, was, I went to live with a certain man where he's passed away. I lived in that. This is a very prominent man of God. And I, I observed, and I'm not putting him down. I just want to show my observation. I'm, I've not mentioned anybody's name. I observe with shock and I observe with horror that I lived with him for about two years. I never saw a single day that he read the epistles. Never, never, never. I never saw it. I was shocked. I was an associate pastor in that ministry. I was more than shocked. No wonder. No wonder he was not passionate about those things. But because I came from a background of, you know, um, Kenneth Hagin and E.W. Kenyon, which rely heavily on that, the epistles are the diet of the believer. We used to have misunderstanding. We used to have misunderstanding. And I was in charge. I was in charge of his adult Sunday school. And sometimes he, when I bring out explanation, he wants to ridicule me in front of the congregation. And I wondered why he behaved like that. I'm doing this to help you. See that now? So I see this. And folks, don't forget this. More of the epistles, I'm not talking about superficial reading. You are sold out to it. Then that is spiritual growth. Less of the epistles, you are not growing spiritually. More of the epistles, your desire for the things of Christ will be fervent. Less of the epistles, your desire for the things of the spirit in terms of Christ will be low. There's no two ways about that. So I can see, I can see where I am at. I can see where everybody is at. When I meet believers, I can know where they are. I can know what is their predominant thought base. Because if you study the epistles, we should all arrive at the same conclusion. When there's a disparity, somebody is not studying well. This is a very serious good. So spiritual good is key. Spiritual good is key. When that does not happen, these are the problems you see. This is why many, 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 many churches can't teach these things correctly. One, you have a problem with the true nature of God. I guarantee you that. You will not be able to teach this correctly. Number two, you will not be able to teach eternal salvation. You will still think you can lose salvation because of certain verses that were written, but it has been read out of context. You will have an identity crisis. You will not know the purpose of the Bible. You use the Bible for everything. When you go and buy rice, you find a Bible verse for rice. Your, your car tire, your car tire spots, you find a Bible verse for your car tire. The cat jumped over the moon, you find a Bible verse for it. It to be a, a complete mess of the word of God. This is where we are at. You walk in myths. You walk in myths. Myths are facts that have been said, but they have no basis of, of substantiation. You walk in cliché. You'll be working in cliche. You know, things like right now, like uh, there's there's something that is going on around, you know, what God cannot do doesn't exist. These are all cliches. You have no basis. If you study the epistles, you will see that there's something wrong with that statement. And I'm not here to 
to deal with that today. And the people and Christians will, will, see, will pull their hair out and be angry over that. You know, well, God cannot do it, does not exist. And they've even made it as even hashtag. If you read the epistles well, you see that there's something wrong with that statement. You can take your side. I am not here to argue. We are learning about spiritual good. If you don't study the epistles well, you have complexes. If you don't study the epistles well, you will not see what is essential and what is not essential. If you don't study the epistles well, you have an attitude problem. Now, because of that, we said this last week that why is it that certain believers are not able to grow up spiritually or grow up in grace? The word grow in grace is, is synonymous or is the same as growing up spiritually. The two mean the same thing. It's just language. Okay. Now, this one thing that has shocked me for years and to date it shocks me that I cannot see how a person says they're a believer. Listen to me carefully. And yet, they still believe these things that I mentioned. You still believe that God can be angry with you. You still believe that you can lose your salvation. You still believe that the Holy Spirit can leave you. It means you are, you have, you are, you are doing what we call mix, mix. That's what the problem is, because I've been there before. So don't think that I'm exempt. I've been there before. Why? I was not reading the epistles well, because the epistles are the explanation of the Old Testament. I was doubling more in the old, and one of my favorite books was the book of Psalms. I didn't know that they were concerning Christ. Now, now, if I say this right now, because you haven't dived into it, you still, you still, you roll your eyes. You say, oh, oh, listen, listen. Hey, look, look, I, I guarantee you, stop it. Take your time. Tell yourself that from today, you're going to give a premium to the epistles. Now, you did not hear me say this. I did not say, don't read the whole Bible. Mm -mm. What I'm saying is that the epistles, the epistles are the diet of the born again man. They explain and reveal the Old Testament. So you start from the epistles and you work your way backwards. Because the background of the epistles is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The background of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is, is Exodus to Malachi. The background of Exodus to Malachi is the book of Genesis. And the background of the entire Bible from Exodus to Revelation is the book of Genesis. So to get the explanation, you need to read the epistles. So if your, if your knowledge is, is you no know, wishy-washy, you know, you just know a few verses in the Old Testament. You just knew a few verses in, in, in epistles. And you yourself, you have not read it. You have only heard it from people, but you have not read the whole context. That is why we are still struggling with this. I, I guarantee you that, if you want to be honest, that is why you are struggling. For me, when I decided to go the whole hog with this, it became easy. See that now? But we, so long as you are still doubling, you are still doubling in certain areas of the Old Testament, and you're, you're not giving a premium, you will not see the light. And no matter what it is taught here, you will fall back on that old way of thinking. See? Now, it is not about a pastor said, it is about the apostolic foundation. So these are the five main things that make, that don't make people to grow up spiritually. Here they are, lightness. We said de dealing in light materials. What are light materials? Things that you read, you hear, you give yourself to, but they don't add anything to what you have got in Christ. Like I said, when I, before I got born again, my favorite books were Enid Blyton, you know, Mario Puzo, you know, and all these kind of writers. But when I got born again, apart from me doing a course, apart from me doing a course, I don't read any literature except the gospel. Apart, if I'm doing a course, like maybe when I was doing my master's, yes, then I'll make time for that. Once in a while, I might, of course, I'll listen to the news, I'll read one or two, but they don't form major. Kabataya, how can me a born again believer? No, I'm not even talking about because I'm a pastor and I'm sitting down and I spend more time reading Mario Puzo. What is that? I spend more time reading Mario Puzo. Something is wrong. That is why no matter the concept, you can't get it. And you have put epistles, Bible, last stage, lightness. Ask yourself, the things you are reading, Kadadaya, do they add anything to what you have received in Christ? 
So there's lightness in the material we read. And it includes social media. You've got to be careful what you read on social media. For some believers, they, are, they act like they, they act like a newborn baby. You know, they just open their mouth wide and they and anything that comes, they just swallow it. They don't take the time. But when it comes to academics, we are diligent in our academics. But when it comes to the word, we play dead. Look at how we shall do primary research, secondary research. Look at how we give ourselves to our management books. But when it comes to Jesus, we play dead. Why? Because we don't see the relevance. Lightness. That attitude is chomping away. Then we are light also in the songs we listen to. Because, because once we hear the word gospel, we don't check the lyrics. So that's what is happening now. You have the epistles here, then you have somebody who sang a song, and the song is diametrically opposite to what Paul wrote, to what Peter wrote, to what James wrote, to what Jesus said. Then the next one is what? Looseness. Looseness in our thinking. And I'm coming to that today. And then the next one is laziness. Laziness of mind. Everybody has got some laziness to some extent, but I'm talking about their mind. Then the next one is loquacious. We spend time talking about many things. I remember when we were born again, when we meet, we might talk about little things, but then our conversation was on the word. What did you read about the Bible today? What didn't you understand? Can we share? We used to do something. Share, let us share your quiet time. Today, believers meet, they will, their whole conversation, nothing about the word. Nothing. Even when you mention the word, they will even oppose. Oh, that. Look, at, can you see that? Oh, that. That. Yeah, you, let's leave that aside. I can't believe it. That, that, the word is Jesus. So that, that is why you place Jesus in your mind. Oh, that, oh, please. Believe us. I, 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 I used to do that when I was young, when I was growing up. Pastors used to come and live in my house in my country. And I used to test them to see where they are. When they come and visit me, I'm talking. Those days, we didn't have DVDs. We had what we call VHS cassettes. I'm still young. I'm still young. <laughs> I'm still young. <laughs> I'm still young. <laughs> you know? And I'll put in a preaching of Dr. Casey Price or Dr. Kenneth Hagen. I want to see where their heart is. And the moment I put the cassette in, these guys say, oh, uh, look, uh, we know him. Uh, let's, let's continue what I see. They will not listen. They will not listen. And I've tested that even here in my house. When you come and visit me, I will, I will change the channel. I'll put it onto a teaching. I'll see your reaction. I want to see where your heart is. You see that? Loquacious. In the things we do, in our plenty talking, Christ is not in it then loving the world system of identity. So for that to happen, before I go to the looseness, you must stay with the word. So there are some things we said, it is a must as a believer. Otherwise, it is a joke. That is why many are light and frothy in the things of God. Many, you have to keep your sense of urgency. You must have a routine. That way we don't like it to be disciplined. These are the things I must do, do them, and enjoy them, even if it's inconvenient. You know, it surprises and shocks me that we can be so gang ho with our physical stuff. But when it comes to the spiritual stuff, we don't put that much, that gang ho ness in it. A life of prayer, you can't run away from it. Some believers, they don't like prayer. When it's prayer, shim, they dodge. You don't like prayer. Prayer is not an option. <laughs> if you believe and still that attitude is on you, it's not an option. It's, it, is the, it is the authority itself. It is the authority itself. Then ministry of studying the word is a must. Obedience to spiritual authority is a must. I'm not talking about domineering. Walking in love. It's a must. We've talked about all this already. Treating all with respect. That is your outward. Then being punctual in all meetings, prayer meetings, Bible study, evangelism. I say this, my life, not because I'm a pastor, I've been doing that since when? 1982. I plan around the word. I know that Tomorrow, Bible study. I my, all my plans. Somebody said, Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, you know, Europe, yeah. We've got this because of knowledge abounds here. Yeah, we are always clever against the gospel. 
Good. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's that's being dogmatic. <laughs> oh, I didn't I didn't believe I heard that. That that's dogmatic. That's that. Oh, then even woman say in the, in the Bible we would chop. Can, can you believe? Can you believe that see, these little things? That's being dogmatic. Oh, oh, oh. But 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 your work, your work that you've been going, you've ironed all your clothes. Is is that not dogmatic? Yeah, because it puts food on the table. Oh. Oh, so, so that's what you, you're talking about, Jesus. Jesus doesn't put food on the table. Oh, I see. Thank you very much. I didn't know that. I didn't know that you put Jesus to that level. I didn't know that. See that? So you plan around. It should be your priority. And I say this without kidding. If things of the spirit for Christ, it's Christ we're dealing with. It's not me. It's not any other person. It's Christ. Ultimately, it's Christ. Why do we gather? Christ. Why are we studying? Christ. So if you have a loose attitude towards this thing, it's Christ you're having that loose attitude towards. It's not me. I am only here as an understanding to function. So if up to now, these things that are, they are intentionally placed for your spiritual edification, they have no place of priority in your life. Ah, something is, something is fundamentally wrong. That you don't like to come to prayer meeting. You don't like to come to Bible study. I'm not talking about us here. I'm talking about generic Christ. I'm talking about generic, the body of Christ. And then you aim to behave well in the house of God. So how, how can that happen? Well, it's a, it, I will say that their persons are the diet. Their persons are the diet. Hence, the believer is to ponder and matter God's word to himself. How long? Daily, regularly, consistently. He is to revolve it in his mind from every angle. Think upon deeply the word. You know, I've never lived like that, so I, I can't relate to that. But, you know, Years before that, there are some believers. Once they, 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 they in, a, in a church thing where they will hear the word of God, the word of God has no place in their life till next Sunday. Folks, that is not good. That is not good. Why? Because it's not about it's not about trying to mark register. No, the reason is that we are being bombarded 24-7 by sense knowledge Monday through Sunday from television, from radio, from online, from friends, from family. So you watch this, you, let's, let's make an assessment. If, if all you have, I'm just giving an example, I'm not, I'm not downplaying the word of God. If all you have in your mind is John 3.16, right? Let's assume John 3.16 represents 1% of the entire knowledge of the epistles, 1%. And then you have news, meeting your friends, hanging out. Now, I'm not saying that you don't do these things. Don't get me wrong. Don't hear what I've not said. Right, I'm, I'm helping you to see something. I'm helping myself to see something. And then let's assume that news, um, hanging out with your friends, reading your meals and boon or whatever book you read, doing all this other stuff that we find legitimate within a 24 hour period represents, let's say 99%. Look at the ratio, 99% uh, 99 of activities that are non-spiritual, although they have their place to the 1% of the word. Can you see why your interest is not in the word? Can you see? Because this 99 will swallow, it will overshadow, it will gazump the 1%. So by the time it comes to Sunday, the oomph is not there. Mm. Mm. So you rather, uh, what is it? What, what time is it? Oh, check. Uh, I can't be bothered. I'll, I'll do it next week. Boom. You see that now? One day becomes one month. One month becomes three months. Three months becomes six months. Now your next position will be, you really don't need to go to church, you know. All these church, church, church. Look, hey, Jesus is my pastor. All I can do, I can stay at home and where God is everywhere. Oh. <laughs> you see that now? So you have to create an enabling environment of the word. You have to. I, I, and I mean it. You call me dogmatic. Joke with that. Joke with that. That is how many have slipped back. Now they are beginning to believe things about Baha'i. Oh. Oh, believer. Now you're beginning to believe in eh, probabilities. The word of God through the pieces will fix that. That's why you need to think about that constantly. And I told you that when I was growing up in the things of God, I used to take, I used to have what I call card index. Like this, right? Well, I think it was, I've forgotten the dimension. I bought a pack of them because those days we didn't have computers, right? And what I did was that when I read the word of God and I came across a web, something that is worth retaining, I write them on those card index. So I did that over time and I had a lot of them, a pack of them like that. So when I was going to work in the morning, as I finished dressing, I pick those a pack of cards, about three or four, and I put it 
I put it in my pocket. And this is what I used to do. You know, whilst I was working, you know, because I'm an educator and I was working, you know, and I have a break, I stand outside. Whilst other people on their break will be smoking cigarettes eh, and doing some stuff, I would take my card index one and there's a Bible verse on it. Let the word of God dwell in you so rich, admonishing each other in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. I take that and I begin to look at it. I look at it. I look at it. Let the word of God. I turn it over in my mind. What am I doing? I am meditating on the word. I'm turning it over in my mind. Well, but today it's much more easier, isn't it? Because you've got earphones. You've got YouTube. You've got, you've got audio books. You know, so you can, you can have audio Bible. So right now in your free time, you know, instead of me listening to some, excuse me, say some junk, that's not going to add anything to my spiritual life. I'd rather hear the word of God. You can listen to my preaching. You can listen to the audio Bible. You can listen to Dr. Ibu I mean, you, I mean, you, you, I mean <laughs> the possibilities are even endless. That you keep that environment. See that? You keep that environment. It will keep your sharpness. So you, when you do that, you remold your mind and then you do what? You unlearn imaginations. You see? Every knowledge and every thought that is against the knowledge of what Christ has done and learns Christ, all that he has done and is doing in, through, and for him. Folks, I will not joke with you. If you don't do this, then it is a joke. You will struggle with the teachings of the word. You will struggle with the revelation because you still have concepts in your mind that are not anchored in the epistles. Remember, the epistles are the diet of the born again man. And until that happens, that's what Paul means, you are still a baby in Christ. See, that means you're a baby in the understanding. You're not growing in the understanding of Christ. What are we to meditate upon? That's the question. First Timothy 4.13, till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Doctrine is in black. Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them. Why? That profiting may appear to all 16. Take heed unto thyself and unto, thy, unto the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this, thou shalt save both thyself and others that hear thee. What is doctrine? Now this word doctrine has got a very bad press among Christians. People think doctrine means do's and don'ts. Some people say, me, I don't do doctrine. See, me, I don't like to go to that church because they do doctrine. <laughs> So to them, doctrine means rules, regulations, requirements. No, dear darling, doctrine does not mean that. The word doctrine comes from the Greek word didaskalu or didaskalia. Dida, 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 split it into two, dida. We get an Eng English derivative, what we got the word didactic or didactic. We've got didactic teaching, didactic engineering, right? What is the meaning of didaskalu? It means teaching. What is the meaning of teaching? It means explanation. See that? So we're talking about explanation. So why are people struggling with the concepts of Christ? Because the explanation was wrong. That is why people still don't understand that you can never lose salvation. Why? Because of the way it was explained to them. The way it was explained to me. Why? Because they don't know that there are three things about salvation. They don't know about salvation of the human spirit, salvation of the soul, salvation of the body. And how do we know that? They don't know that the apostles had a style of letting us know which one they were talking about. When they are talking about salvation of the spirit, they use past tense designation. When they are talking about salvation of the soul, they use the imperative or the present continuous tense. When they talk about salvation of the body, they use the future tense. But you have to know which one came first, salvation of the body, Salvation of the soul, salvation of the spirit, obviously, is the salvation of the spirit. And if you know some English language, because he uses past tense verb when he's talking about salvation of the spirit, we know in English language that past tense means a completed action that is irreversible. So in reading, you must not begin to do what? Separate that. But the problem people have is that they are seeing, you know, walk, which is what? A command, which is what? What is what verb is that imperative? And they think that that because it says it means you can lose your salvation. So because of the explanation that is flawed, they cannot see how that salvation can never be lost. 
It means that one, the one teaching it has not read the epistles well to see this, this nuance I'm talking about. Number two, they themselves have not read enough. They don't know. So they just conclude. So doctrine is explanation. And the explanation is not anyhow. I'm so glad that the explanation is embedded in the word already. So 1 Timothy 1.10, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for pejorators. Now, anytime Paul writes like this, like in Galatians chapter 5, he is not saying that you are doing it. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is that he's talking about the characteristics, the integuments of the man that is not born again. It is inside his nature, whether he does it or not. He's not saying that because a person does this, that also that he has lost their salvation. That's not what he's talking about. Read the context well. For patriot persons, and if there be any other thing that is sound to sound doctrine. So the word sound doctrine is hugayinu. The word sound is hugayinu, holistic. And how, how can you know a sound doctrine? The answer is in the verse 11. According to the glorious gospel or according according to the explanation of the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust, me, Apostle Paul. So sound, healthy, wholesome doctrine refers to the gospel of Christ. What is the gospel of Christ? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it said that, that I, Paul, I received to that which was passed unto me, how that according to the scriptures, Christ died according to the scriptures. He was buried according to the scriptures. And then what? He rose again according to the scriptures. That is the gospel. So it's the explanation according to that. Because if you know that he died, he was buried, he rose again, it's a done deal, then that means that what? It is an accomplished fact. So then it's no more going to be that he's now going to. The moment I step into going to, God is about to. I am no more in the facts of the gospel. Next year is my year of blessing. That is not the gospel. Because next year is future tense. You are still saying that Christ has not done it. He has done it, but you don't know how to take advantage of it. See that now? Next year is my year of favor. That is not the gospel. It can never be the gospel. Favor was given to the day you received Christ. Didn't you read it in John chapter 1? So he is to meditate on the written word. The reality of who he is in Christ. Christ, look at the tense, finished work. Anytime it's finished work, it's talking about a born again spirit, what it has received. So that is spirit salvation. Soul salvation is ongoing. It doesn't mean that you lose your salvation. He secured your spirit first. But soul salvation is what we are dealing with. Soul salvation is equal to spiritual good. It's now your mind coming to terms or to grips with what your spirit status is in Christ. You are already, but your mind is slow in catching up. Not the statement. It's like if you don't give yourself to doctrine, to that explanation of what Christ has done, found in the epistles, you're profiting. Note that the profiting appears to men and not to God. In other words, our actions are not for God, but for men. Because the men don't know Jesus. You can only know it through us who claim to be the, the word adherents of Christ. That's why Paul said that you yourself, your lives are a written epistle. God has already made you his workmanship. He has given birth to you by spirit. Hence, kadadada, spiritual growth is when my actions align with the reality of who I am in Christ. Now, show you where the church has gone wrong with this. For so many years, the church has focused on conduct of character, morality, more than basing it on facts of the finished work. The facts of the finished work, when understood, will automatically bring you your conduct and morality in line. So we do it the other way around. We spend more time bashing and speaking about morality, and they don't know anything about what Christ has done. No, don't know that what Christ has done is the, is the panacea, is the cure to that actions that they are living in. 
So if you see the style in Paul, in every writings he wrote, and also, and also Peter, and also John, they will start first with salvation of the spirit in their writing. In chapter one, in chapter two, in chapter three, what Christ has done, who you are, spirit salvation. Then when they have, they have exhausted that, then they might even give only one chapter or two chapters to salvation of your soul, spiritual good. Now, with that information, once it's anchored in you, it will exude out of you naturally. So that's why there's a lot of hypocrisy in the church because we've done it the other way around. So spiritual growth is when my actions of what Christ has done align with the reality of who I am in Christ. Of course, when you think about it, of what benefit of what sense is it to me, for me to say I'm a Christian, but I don't know what Jesus has done. Look at the name, Christian, Christ, Christ I am, eh? Christ I am, I am Christ-like. In what? In what? In what he has done. How many of those facts are in you? How many? So it is when your actions align with the reality of who I am in Christ. Up to now, believers are still struggling, whether they have generational cares or not. Look at that. Look at that. I want you to show me Bible and verse. Remember, the epistles are died. Show me from the book of Romans to the book of Jude, anywhere where Paul wrote about generational cares. It is not even there. Tell me also. Anywhere where Jesus spent time sitting the disciples and say, guys, sit down. Let me tell you about something. See, even though I am with you, you know, what your forefathers did is still chasing you. What? Up to now, 2,000 years plus, believers are still prancing around this wrong, erroneous concept of generational case. Why? Somebody took it from the Old Testament and did not read the context because for every word of God to be accepted as a contextual application, 2 Corinthians 13 tells us that at the mouth of two or three witnesses that every word be established. Then you know what they do because they don't understand that. They take one, then they look at people's experiences. Folks, you cannot use somebody's experience to counterbalance the word of God. Because I don't live with them. I don't know what they do on, in 24-7. I don't know whether they know about the epistles. I don't know whether they know about what Christ has done. I don't know whether they speak in tongues a lot. I don't know that. I don't live with them. So how can I use somebody's experience? Oh, yeah, Pastor Fred, you know, but I know of this guy. You know, I know that Jesus died for us. But this guy, their brothers did not get married. Their sisters did not get married. Their aunties, their cat, their parakeet did not get married. Isn't that generational case? You are using a single isolated case to make a nonsense of all that Jesus. So you are saying that Genesis to Revelation is useless. And you will rather go with somebody's experience who you don't even live with. I don't know what they are doing over there. You see that now? Up to now, that area is still not even sorted. Meanwhile, Paul never wrote about generation. Rather, he said in Colossians that he got in Christ has what has delivered us from the dominion of darkness, Kabataya, past tense, and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son, Alubayaya, in whom we have redemption, which is the forgiveness of sins. I would rather believe that than to believe a fly that flies around my house as somebody's grandma coming to attack me. Still believe you up to now, you, have, you still believe generational case up to now. So you have not read anywhere in the epistles. Where is it? Show me one verse. Oh, then then another one. Altar versus altar. <laughs> Show me where Paul wrote about altar versus altar. So that means that they don't know the difference of the purpose of each part of the Bible. They say, everybody's in the Bible. Thank you very much. We are not going to fight. Let's walk in love. Show me also. Solomon married how many women? Is it not in the Bible? Is it, oh no, that one you see. Oh, oh, so now you are cherry picking. You are cherry picking. Eh, but see, as for Solomon, we know that that's all right. So, so the altar verse, altar to that one to his right. Where did they take it from? Gideon, Judges chapter six. It was Gideon that said that. It was not God who said it. And that was not even the context. For, for information, altar means in Bible language, place where animal is sacrificed. It referred to the brazen altar. Up to now, 
still 2,000 years after Christ. Why? This is where the problem is. That means they are doubling more in Old Testament than the facts that cause spiritual good, the epistles. Up to now, still believers believe that altar, altar is after them. If you enter the facts of the, of the epistles, it will just clear away all that nonsense. Hence, spiritual good is when my actions align with what? The reality of who I am in Christ. I cannot overemphasize that. And not an attempt to please God or meet up to certain standards. He has accepted us in Christ. We already have peace with him. Look at Ephesians 1.4. According as he had chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, past tense, spirit salvation, that we should be holy and without blame. That sentence, look at really well. He's not saying that you now try to be holy. He said that once you have been chosen in him, the aim of you being chosen is him that the word holy means hagiasmos. It means that you have been taken out from Adam's world and brought into Christ's nature world. Without blame before him, you know, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ, to himself, according to the good, uh, 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 according to what? Bad pleasure, good pleasure of his will. Verse 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace. Look at such choice words. Where he has made us, look at that. He has made us what? Accepted. Not going to be. Since the day you receive Christ, you are accepted forever. In the beloved. Therefore, being justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Look at Romans 5.1. Therefore, being, 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 being. Not going to. Being. These are the facts that should, that should be, when these facts are saturated in your understanding, that is where spiritual growth is. And that in itself will spark fervency of spirit. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace. That word peace here is not peace like United Nations. Yeah, this word peace. Translation is always a problem. The word peace here is irene, E-I-R-E-N-E. -E. It means in an inseparable union. He's talking about your spirit. That he said, therefore being justified by faith, when you were just when you received Jesus by faith, that moment, his spirit and your new spirit was were fused together. So how can Satan occupy that place? It's impossible for two spirits, the spirit of Jesus and the Satan's spirit be in you. Now we can only get, as it were, attacks from external. That's normal. But it is impossible for a born again believer to be possessed of Satan. It cannot be. Because Jesus has occupied the place. Thus, we are not to perform or score points when it comes to spiritual good. To do so will be to have the consciousness of the law of Moses. We are to keep looking, beholding. The reality of who we are in him until we unconsciously practice the word of the finished work of Christ. That is, the believer is not trying to come or trying to become. Rather, the reality of his nature, which is his born again spirit, is to dawn on him. Hence, we do not become who we are because what we, of what we do or do not do. We are who we are by. We are who we are by our union with him. See, you see, you see how that is even making you struggle in your mind? Because why? All through our church age, you see, all through our church age, you see, what has been, they've been preaching at us, you know, it has been more, it has been more of, you know, conduct and morality. If we do this, you're a Christian. If we don't do this, you're not, I don't think you're a Christian. We behave like this. But what you've forgotten, sin is sin. The law identifies sin to bring Israel as, as a schoolmaster to Christ. That is, to get to the place where they realize that <laughs> I can't do it. Why? Because we sin in our mind. We sin in, in our emotions. We sin with our thoughts. We sin with our mouth. We sin with our actions. Always. And who is going to make it? Who is going to make it? So if it is more of do and don't, uh, because what we do is that we, 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 we talk about the one that can be visible. Adultery, fornication, lying. And I'm not downplaying that. But every sin is sin. So what about the one who despises people? Uh, you despise people. 
What about the one that talks by heart to people? Isn't that sin? That's 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 hamatian. You miss the mark. We are supposed to. The Bible says that let your word be seasoned with salt. Huh? So isn't that also sin? So so what? So that is not the that's not the target. See that we are not what we are because of what we do. We are because of uh, we are united in Him. That's why Paul used the word in, in Romans twelve two. Hence Paul's use of the word transformed in Romans two twelve. And be not conformed. I told you what that word is. Suskematizo to the world, but be transformed, metamorpho, by the renewing, dokimos of your mind. It's, it's declining with that word here, renewing of mind, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And this one is not talking about the fact that God's will will is three times. I, I used to preach it like that years ago. God's will is good. Then there's the acceptable will. Then there's the perfect. no, no, no. Look at the end. He's just saying that it's one thing he's talking about. It's one thing he's talking about. That God's will, basically, what he has done is perfect. So as we saw earlier, the word transform. Now, all this is when you give yourself to the word constantly. Then these facts will begin to now alter the way you think. Until you sit by the persons, you can be a believer and you still believe. You still believe that there are generational curses. So that's where the transformation is to take place. You need to now feed on the person. The word transformed was translated from the Greek word, word metamorpho. It is the root of the English word metamorphosis. It implies a change. He's not talking about your spirit. He's talking about your soul, your mind. A transformation from within to outside. What you have received in Christ now grows and now comes to what? Affect your thinking. So now it begins to topple. It begins to topple. It begins to topple all wrong concepts. Folks, I guarantee you that if all of us here and all believers knew that the epistles are the dying and we all sat by and fed on it, I tell you, there will be no more problems in church. There will be no more problems in church. I guarantee you that. We'll all be thinking the same way. That's why the apostles were successful when they said that they were united. They knew what the content of the word of God was and they all thought the same way. It further implies developmental stages in growth. He's talking about the mind. Observe that the same person is being transformed, how? By the renewing of his mind. So if you don't renew your mind in the epistles, you still believe in, you still believe in generational cases. You still believe in altar versus altar. You will believe it to the, to the hilt. No matter what I teach here, you will still believe it. Why? Because you yourself, you will not stand down in the epistles to let the epistles wash your mind correctly and fix it accurately. You are living off what somebody is saying. This therefore implies that, that when the reality of who the believer is dawns on him, he will give expressions to the ongoing work of God through him. Thus, we are not trying to become anything. We are only giving expressions to our nature because we are born with those experiences. That's why Paul made a statement. He was shocked at these saints in Corinth. He exposed constant query to the church at Corinth. Know ye not that you are? Not that you are going to become. You are. You are. How, how can somebody stand and say that, you know, you are born again, all right, but you have generational case. You know, that statement in itself is an insult to the work of grace. You mean that Jesus did not do a good job. Jesus hasn't, didn't think the thing through well. That he did it patchy, patchy. That when you are born again, there's a chance that a, a, a generational demon of some fad is. The, what is that? What is that? How can you compare me to Gideon? How can you compare me to David? Did you not read in Hebrews chapter 11, the last part, that, that these people without us are not made perfect? They were looking to our day. The Bible said, and Abraham saw my day. We are, we are far in a different league. That's why he said in 1 Corinthians 3 16. Know ye not that ye are not going to be the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwelleth in you? Are you not, are you not aware of it? Are you not conscious of it? Corinth, Corinthians, what's going on here? He said the same thing. First Corinthians 6 2. Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are you unwilling to judge the smallest matters? Shocking. And then in the verse 15, know you know that your bodies are the members of Christ. Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of an hallowed? God forbid. What know you know that that which is joined to an hallowed is one body for this for the for two set 
shall become one flesh. But he that is joined, look at the verse 7, he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Then he, he answered, what? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which dwells in you. You're not a cheap person, you know that. Don't let people just throw you around with some wrong cliches. You are more than what meets the eye. You are more than what meets the eye. Stop being subjected to those things. And you know something is against you. Something is fighting you. Something is against you. Something is fighting you. All that is all that. What? To whom which Christ paid the price of this blood? You are purchased not with silver or gold, but the precious blood. That's a very expensive thing there. So don't let an ignoramus say those things to you, who you are princely and queenly, if the English will allow me. Stay, square yourself up. Decide I am going to grow spiritually. How? By staying in the word of his grace, which are what? The epistles. And you will see the transformation yourself. When I started to sit in the epistles and started to study them, I would start hearing people preaching and I could start to see the gaps. I had not even gone to any Bible school. The same epistles started to open my eyes. When I started reading the book of Hebrews and I saw the, the contrast of the comparison of life under, under before the, the law, in the law, before the cross, and life after. Then I said, what are these people saying? I began to see that I thought it looks like the Bible had been rewritten. I used to, I used to rub my eyes and say, why can't they see this? I'll read Galatians and I'll come across things that by the works of the Lord, no flesh shall be justified. And they are telling you that you'll be justified by works. Something is wrong somewhere. You come to that conclusion yourself. Spiritual growth is paramount by the epistles. Otherwise, you'll be staying in that parking lot and you'll just be heaping things upon you. And when Jesus returns and when he opens the curtain to show you that this is what you were all this time, ah, I have been deceived too late. In Jesus' name, amen.